Chapter Ten of the Seventh Sleuths Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seventh Sleuths Club by Carol Norton. Chapter Ten. Wanted a housekeeper. Meanwhile, Colonel Wainwright was facing a new problem. While living alone, he had needed very little waiting on. A faithful Chinese cook had provided his meals, and the wife of his hired man had come in daily from their quarters over the stables to clean the house. But the O'Haras had decided to return to Ireland. Geraldine, of course, was absolutely helpless, and the Colonel decided that what he needed was a refined and somewhat elderly housekeeper, one who would be a good influence in the home. Just where to find such a person he could not think at first, but he happened to recall his old friend Mrs. Thompson, who had transformed her fine house on Hickory Lane, not far from the girls' seminary, into a home for old ladies. It wasn't a charitable plan, exactly. It was a home for homeless old ladies, of some means whose last days would be made far happier than they could be elsewhere. Mrs. Thompson herself retained a large front room overlooking the beautiful grounds, and spent her summers there. Winters she lived either in Europe or with her son in New York. But only that day he had seen in the paper that for some reason Mrs. Thompson was spending a few weeks at her country home, and the courtly old gentleman decided to visit her and ask her advice about how best to solve the problem with which he was confronted. Half an hour later he was walking under the leafless hickory trees that formed a veritable grove surrounding a very large turreted wooden house, one of the oldest in the village. A pleasant-faced little old woman answered his ring, ushering him into the small reception room, and went to summon Mrs. Thompson. He had not long to wait, for his elderly friend, dressed in a simple black silk, as she had been all through the years since her husband had died, soon appeared and greeted him graciously. After explaining that her return had been because of a need for a quiet and simple affair than she could really obtain easily in her son's New York home, the old gentleman explained his mission, telling how he had unexpectedly acquired a family and so had need of a housekeeper. Before his story was finished, he knew by the brightening expression in the fine face of the old lady that she had someone in mind to suggest. Nor was he wrong. "'I believe Mrs. Gray is just the one for you,' she told him. She admitted you just now. Then, before Mr. Wainwright could reply, Mrs. Thompson continued, Mrs. Gray came to us recently, during my absence. I know nothing at all of her past life. We ask no questions here. It is, as you know, merely a home, boarding house, for gentlewomen. I asked Mrs. Gray this morning if she were happy with us, and she said, with a wistful expression on that unusually sweet face of hers, that she was afraid she would never be entirely contented without a home to keep, and she asked me if she might go down into the kitchen now and then and stir up a pudding or something. Now my theory is that she is a born housekeeper, and just the one you need. Colonel Wainwright agreed, and the little old lady who longed to putter about in a kitchen was called, and the proposition was made to her. The other two knew by the brightening of her softly wrinkled face that she was delighted to accept. The colonel had told about the two Morrison children, as he called them, who had come to spend the winter with him, and by the tender light that glowed in her eyes he was assured that she loved young people and would have for them an understanding sympathy. "'Mrs. Gray,' he said, when the arrangements had been completed, "'there is about you a haunting suggestion of someone whom I once knew.' Ever since you admitted me an hour ago, I have been trying to think who it is that you resemble, but I have given it up. The little old lady smiled pleasantly as she replied, It does seem that everywhere I go, folks think I look like somebody they've known. Well, that's about all there is to it, the old man acknowledged. I have had the same thing happen to me. Judge Crow, up in Dorchester, and I are supposed to be doubles. Then, holding out his hand, first to one and then the other of the old ladies, he expressed his deep gratitude to them both, ending with a promise to send for Mrs. Gray and her baggage that very afternoon. And so it happened that on the third day after the arrival of the young people, another member was added to their household. Colonel Wainwright had welcomed the little old lady, and had at once introduced her to Geraldine and Alfred. Then he had walked to town, leaving them to their own devices. It was quite evident that Geraldine's good humour of the day before had departed, for she acknowledged the introduction with a barely perceptible nod and had risen at once to go to her own room. 
Never before had she been introduced to a housekeeper, as though she was one of her own class. Colonel Wainwright was certainly old-fashioned. Servants were servants, she considered, whatever they were called. Alfred, who had promised to go skating with Jack and Bob, had welcomed the old lady in the friendliest manner, and she knew at once that she was going to love the boy, but the girl? That was quite a different matter. The colonel had shown the housekeeper to her pleasant room overlooking the orchard, when her trunk and bags had been taken in there. He had also introduced her to Ching Li, the plump, smiling Chinaman in the kitchen. When she was quite alone, the old lady stood by a window in her room, gazing out at a sparkling, snow-covered scene, and her eyes were misty. How happy she had been when the colonel had told her she was to make a home, a real home, for a boy and girl. One of the unfulfilled desires of her life was to have had grandchildren. She blinked a bit, then wiped her eyes with a handkerchief and smiled at the scene before her. Well, she comforted herself by thinking, I'll pretend these two are my grandchildren, and I'll treat them just as lovingly as though they really were, and I'll begin that game right now. Putting a clean white apron over her soft grey dress, she went down the wide upper hall towards the front room which was Geraldine's. Meanwhile that rebellious girl was unpacking her trunk in a manner which showed that it was a most distasteful task. Never before had she lifted her fingers to wait on herself. Susan, her maid, had always done everything for her. She had asked her father to permit her to bring Susan to Sunnyside with her, but he had said that he could not ask his old friend to take three people into his home. As she thought of this injustice, her anger mounted higher and higher, and she took things from her trunk and actually threw them over the bed, chairs and lounge. Every conceivable spot was littered when there came a tap on the door. "'Come in!' the girl said suddenly, supposing that it was her brother whom wished to speak to her. Instead, a smiling little old lady opened the door. "'Why, Geraldine, child,' she said kindly, "'you are busy, aren't you? Unpacking and hanging things up is quite an undertaking, but I think folks like to do it themselves. Then they know where things were put.' The girl's face reddened with very evident displeasure. "'Well, I don't like it,' she said coldly, "'and I don't see why I should have to do it.' I've always had a maid to wait on me, and I've simply got to have one. Now that you've come, I suppose you'll make my bed and keep my room in order. The old lady had had a talk with the colonel about this very matter, and he had definitely said that waiting on the girl was not one of her duties. Explain that Mr. Morrison had especially requested that she learn how to care for herself. Very quietly, Mrs. Gray replied, No, little girl, that is not one of my duties. Then, as the front door bell was ringing, the housekeeper went to answer it. Geraldine, standing among the confusion and litter, watched the retreat with flashing eyes. Little girl, indeed! Our housekeeper always addressed me as Miss Geraldine. Country ways and country servants are certainly hard to understand. Her torrent of angry thoughts was interrupted by a sweet voice calling, Geraldine, two girls are coming up to see you. Geraldine looked around the room wildly, but before she had time to decide what she could do to prevent the girls from entering, they were standing in the open door. "'Oh, good morning, Miss Drexel and Miss Lee,' the unwilling hostess exclaimed, with a quickly assumed graciousness which had been acquired at the young lady's select seminary. "'Wait until I remove a few dresses from the chairs, and I will ask you to be seated.' Doris and Mary exchanged puzzled glances. They felt Geraldine's true attitude of mind, and the former said, "'Oh, Miss Morrison, we really ought not to have made so early a morning call, but we have decided to go to the Drexel Lodge on Little Bear Lake tomorrow, and there are so many things to talk about. We did try to telephone, but the line is out of order, but first do let us help you put your things away.' To Geraldine's amazement, the two girls removed their wraps, laughing and chatting the while in a most sociable fashion. "'I'm going to suggest that we drop formality,' Mary said, "'and call each other by our first names. "'And now, Geraldine, I just know that you are ever so tired with unpacking, "'so you sit here and tell us where you want these dresses hung, "'and presto, we'll have them up in a twinkling.' "'But I cannot permit you girls to wait upon me,' the hostess protested. "'Why not?' Doris inquired. "'My mother said that the most beautiful thing that we can do "'is loving service for another.' "'Oh, what a darling dress this is! It glows like jewels, doesn't it, Mary?' The city girl was rather pleased to be showing off her elaborate wardrobe to these village girls, who were quite evidently impressed. "'Oh, that's just one of my party gowns,' she said indifferently. "'I have several.' Then she confessed, 
I honestly don't know how to go about hanging them up. I have just stepped out of my clothes, and Susan, my maid, has put them away. My, how I would hate to have anyone tagging me around all the time like that, Mary exclaimed, and not too tactfully. It would get on my nerves. Geraldine drew herself up haughtily, and bit her lip to keep from replying. Her two guests, with many exclamations of admiration for the dresses, hung them up in the long closet, and then, when the task was finished, Mary announced, "'Now I will show you my latest accomplishment, of which I am real proud.' Her chum laughed as she explained, "'You see, Geraldine, my mother has a companion, who is also a trained nurse, and last week she taught Mary how to make a bed in hospital fashion, and the next day, when I went over to the Lees, Mary had made and unmade her bed seven times, trying to get it perfect.' "'There's quite a knack to it,' that maiden smilingly declared, as she stretched, smoothed, and tucked in the sheets and blankets. Then she stood back proudly and surveyed her accomplishment. She said, "'Mother thinks my bed-making is a work of art.' Geraldine wanted to say that she did not consider menial labour of any kind an art, but she refrained from making the comment. Mary sank down in an easy chair by the fireplace, and looked around with a radiant smile. "'Everything was cleared away like magic, wasn't it?' she said sociably. But then she added philosophically, "'If one dreads a thing, it makes the doing of it doubly hard. But when one pretends that it's going to be great fun, it gets done much more quickly. Don't you think so, Geraldine?' Poor Geraldine's head was in a whirl. Somehow she could not adjust herself to the view of things held by these country girls. The Colonel had told her that Mr. Lee was the wealthiest man in the countryside, and, of course, she knew the financial and social standing of the Drexel family, and yet these girls had been taught that it was a privilege to render loving service, and that bed-making was an art. "'Now we must tell you all of our grand and glorious plans for tomorrow's lark,' Doris began as she drew up her chair cosily. Then they chatted about the sleigh-ride and the skating party, and when, at last, the little clock on the mantel chimed the hour of twelve, Mary sprang up and looked out the window. "'Here comes the boys,' she said. "'I made them promise that they would call for us at noon. They have been down to the lake to clean off a space on the ice for our skating party.' "'I'm so glad, Geraldine, that you like to skate,' Doris exclaimed as she slipped on her fur coat. "'You'll want to wear your heaviest shoes and leggings on the sleigh-ride party, and your oldest, warmest clothes.' "'You don't need to bring anything towards the picnic part. "'You and Alfred are to be our guests of honour to-morrow. "'Good-bye.' "'That night the Colonel, finding Geraldine standing alone in front of the fireplace in the living-room, "'slipped a fatherly arm about her, saying, "'Little girl, I know how hard it is going to be for you to get used to our country ways, "'and I was thinking that perhaps you would like to go to Dorchester with me to-morrow "'and spend the day with your friends.' "'Oh, but I couldn't, Uncle Colonel,' was the unexpected reply, brightly given. "'The girls and boys in Sunnyside are giving a welcoming party for Alfred and me. "'It's a sleigh-ride out on the lake road to the Drexel Lodge, "'and there is to be skating, and a ride home in the moonlight. "'I never was so interested in anything before in all my life.' "'That's good news,' the Colonel replied, deeply touched because the girl had, "'almost unconsciously, used the name which he had taught her when she was very small.' "'Well, some other time you may go with me to the city. "'I go there often to attend to business matters.' "'That night, after the young people had retired to their rooms, "'the Colonel and Mrs. Gray exchanged confidences, "'and each felt hopeful that the unfortunate motherless girl "'was soon to have a change of heart.' End of chapter 10